welcome you um, to uh, the Novogrid Jewish Resistance Museum virtual tour with Shifra Pupko and Tamara Vershitskaya. Um, to uh, introduce myself, um, my name is Deborah Brunner, um, and uh, I, I'm also introducing uh, Artur Lifshitz, who is based in Belarus. Um, he is uh, my co-founder of the Together Plan, and I am also the co-founder of Jewish Tapestry Project, which is um, based in the United States. Um, so just a short introduction from me, and then I'll be passing you over to Tamara. So I will uh, leave this screen up um, while I'm speaking, um, just so that you have something to look at um, and you can listen to my voice. So the Together Plan, just as an introduction, is a UK charity which was founded in October 2013. International Charitable Organisation Dialogue is the Together Plan's partner in Belarus, and they enable and facilitate the work of the charity on the ground. We also have a new partner in the USA, the Incorporated Jewish Tapestry Project, sister nonprofit to the Together Plan, who are based in California. The Together Plan supports the provision of development assistance through the promotion of community capacity building. The charity is able to work across the landscape that is the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, but its current focus is Belarus, where we're working to help communities and individuals learn tools for self-development and self-determination with a long-term aim to build better civil society for a more tolerant and cohesive society. In 2018, we took a decision to approach community capacity building through the lens of Jewish cultural heritage. Years of working in the country demonstrated that there was a burgeoning need for people to explore their history, their heritage, and their identity. Not just Jewish people, but non-Jewish people too. For so many years, Jews, have occupied um, these lands, helped to shape its history, the landscape, the architecture, the food, the thinking, the politics, and even the forests. Thousands and thousands of Jews lived and thrived on the lands that are today modern day Belarus. But this long and rich history is peppered with dark and catastrophic times, brutal pogroms, the Holocaust, repressions during the Soviet period, the refuseniks and what is today and what is today's fragile Jewish community. So many Belarusian Jews fled across the globe and through our work we give people a way to reconnect to their ancestral homes, the cemeteries where their ancestors are buried, the places where their families hid, fought, died or survived, access to the records of their ancestors. All of this validates people's lives their stories of survival meaning to who they are as human beings. The Together Plan, Dialogue and Jewish Tapestry Project are now taking a key role in bringing the story of the Bielski camp, the partisans and the stories of resistance into focus. And we are delighted to welcome you all here today. This meeting is taking place at a historic time. When we decided to put this event together, None of us could have imagined Putin's bombs and bullets would be raining down on the heads of the Ukrainians and the fastest growing refugee crisis since, the World War, since World War II would be playing out in front of our very eyes. It is a tragic time for humanity. Yet, we are seeing incredible acts of resistance on the part of the Ukrainians ready to fight for what they believe and for their homeland. We know all too well that the Jews who tunneled out of the Novogrid labor camp to become partisans, and indeed many brave Jews in the name of resistance, took up arms against their Nazi oppressors. And what we are witnessing today is an echo from history. None of us thought we would see this in our lifetime. So I would just like to ask that we have a minute silence for those in Ukraine, those who have tragically already lost their lives over this past week of fighting. And at the end of that one minute, I'm going to play a short piece of music, a prayer, um, and then we will move. I will then um, pass over to Tamara Vershitskaya.
Sorry. Now hand over to Tamara Vershitska, who is in the Belarus. Deborah, I'm really sorry. Can I just can I just ask everyone if you have any questions? Could you uh, try to put them in a chat? So we will structure it uh, a sort of either way, and we'll try to respond to as many as possible, rather than just trying to speak after the after the presentation. Uh, I mean, we will have a chance to speak as well, but if if to uh, be more organized, uh, I would like to ask you to put your questions in the chat, which then we will um, be responding to them. Thank you, Tamara. Oh, thank you. Uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, dear guests, I'm really grateful to everybody that you answered our call and joined us today, tonight. We invited you to a very special tour at the Jewish Resistance Museum in Novogrodok. Our guide today is Shifra Pupko, a guide and educator at Yad Vashem. I'm sure many of you, if not everybody, have a question why a guide from the leading Holocaust museum in the world is presenting a special yet small museum in Novogrudok. Let me tell you a bit how Shifra and I met last summer. Shifra visited Belarus twice when the world came to a halt because of pandemic. Her first visit was with her husband and friends. The Museum of Jewish Resistance in Novogrudok was a total surprise to her. She didn't expect anything of the kind in Belarus. Her second visit was specifically planned. Shifra came again for three weeks last September. Uh, her aim was to collect material uh, for her thesis about commemoration and memorialization of the Holocaust in Belarus. We spent two of the three weeks together traveling in and around Novogrudok. Shiva also visited Brest, Pinsk, Minsk, Babruisk, other places. And during her trips, she realized how really special Jewish Resistance Museum in Novogrudok is. I created this museum, or rather a memorial exhibition at the Getter site in 2007. Looking back, it seems a miracle. We did it without any support from the state. All I had was the support from one person, one survivor, Jack Kagan, may his memory be blessed, and of Boris Krotin, a director general of Lior Plastics, uh, an Israeli-Belarusian joint venture 
uh, acting, uh, which operates in Novogrodok today. At the time we met with Shifra, I was full of emotions after the workshop we had at the Belsky camp in the Nalibaki forest. Uh, this workshop was part of the project we realized last year together with Mediel, a company from Belgium. By the way, our lead coordinator, Andre Bossuroy, is with us today. During that project, uh, which was supported by uh, the German foundation EVZ, we tested a new form of working with young people in places of memory, using an interdisciplinary approach, an art workshop. Uh, was the form we tested, and it was led by uh, Roman Kroc, a German artist. Some of the participants of that art workshop are with us today. I see Larissa from Poland. Well, I shared with Shifra my dream, my uh, wish, which I have been cherishing for many, many years, to commemorate the Belsky partisans in the Nalibaki forest at the campsite, which is known as Forest Jerusalem. We were lucky to find understanding uh, with the Together Plan. Now, with the support of the Together Plan, represented here by Deborah Brunner, the CEO of the charity, and Arthur Lifshitz, co-director of the Together Plan in Belarus, who are now taking a key role in bringing the story of the Belsky camp, the story of Jewish partisans and many stories of resistance into focus, we begin a series of events. Today is the first meeting and it is about the Jewish Resistance Museum in Novokrudo. I'm giving, giving a word to our guide, Shifra Pupko. Tamara, wow, thank you so much for that, that beautiful introduction. Um, hello, uh, my name is Shifra Pupko, and I would like to share a story with you this evening about the Jewish community of Novogradic. I had the pleasure of meeting Tamara when I traveled to Belarus, uh, first in June, and then again in October when I am completing my Holocaust history degree at the Haifa University here in Israel. Tonight, we are offering the first part of a three-part series. It is our hope to build a broad coalition of descendants, historians, scholars, students, activists, anyone who is committed to Jewish history in Belarus, and specifically to build a memorial in the Nalaboki Forest dedicated to the Bielski family camp. Now, some of you have been to the, to the museum uh, and for others, this is your first time hearing about it. So tonight I designed a presentation to give us a brief sweeping history of the people in town, a glimpse into the museum that stands there today, and the story of the great tunnel escape that took place there in 1943. Last, tonight we are discussing a horrific moment in history, but it is a moment that at the very least deserves to be told honestly and truthfully. But because I don't know exactly who's in the audience, I wanted to make you aware that my presentation may not be suitable for, for younger viewers. Now, I want to begin tonight by sharing a video of Novogradic before the war. And a lot of times people say, well, Schiffer, why are we starting before the war? Why? And I think this has a lot to do with because when we often think of the Holocaust, we think of Jews in terms of being victims in terms of percentages or even statistics. And yet long before the Jews of Novogradic became victims, they were people, individuals, each who had their own stories, hopes and dreams. Second, what was lost in Novogradic was not just the Jewish individual, but a thriving dynamic Jewish community that had first been established in the 15th century. That's 500 years of stories, music, art, literature, religious tradition, and a culture that no longer exists. So this helps us remember that. This film is a montage 
a moving mosaic of found footage and photos taken between 1914 and 1931 and gives us a glimpse of their lives. Novogradic is what we would call a shtetl or a small community with a large but not majority Jewish population. During and immediately following World War I, Novogradic changed hands several times from Russians to Germans, Poles, Soviets, and again, Poles, making life very miserable for all of the inhabitants, including the Jews. By 1931, there was an estimated 6,000 Jewish inhabitants and a population that continued to grow despite the international economic crisis. By 1939, there were some 6,500 Jews in the town. There were three synagogues, and quite a number of small prayer groups organized according to trades. A middle yeshiva and a higher yeshiva engaged their students in Talmudic studies. Rabbi Meir Abovowitz, an opponent of Zionism, led the very famous Beit Yosef Yeshiva in the 1930s, whereas the town rabbi, Meir Merkowitz, was a Zionist. However, the 1930s were a time of great change, urbanization, modernity, and as the influence of religious tradition declined, the younger generation veered to more secular movements. Zionists like Hashir, uh, Hashomer Hatzir, right-wing Beitar and Bund movements were all represented in this town. Novogradic also had several schools. There was a very popular seventh grade Hebrew school founded in 1918, as well as a religious Zionist school, a Yiddish school, a Polish gymnasium. Following centuries of tradition, education remained a cornerstone of Jewish life. Now, the majority of Jews could be described as lower middle class, small shopkeepers, a very, very large number of craftsmen, and even merchants, while the poor included peddlers, the unemployed, and manual laborers. There was a close connection to agriculture, as most Jewish families owned or leased parcels of land on which they grew vegetables and fruits and maintained cows or goats. There was no specific Jewish neighborhood although a few of the wealthier families in Novogradic owned homes in the town square, whereas the majority were peppered throughout the town. And I think this says so much about the relationship between the Jews and the non-Jews within the community itself. So thank you, Avi. I'm gonna pause that. Now, as a result of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Agreement of August 23rd and the ensuing German invasion of Poland, Soviet troops entered the area on September 17th. They arrived in Novogradic the exact same day. Now, for the Jews, the Soviets were obviously a preferable option to the Germans, being that rumors about German atrocities had already begun to arrive with the um, refugees fleeing occupied Poland. This is important to understand as both Western Belarus and Western Ukraine suffered under Soviet occupation for almost two years before, the Nazi, uh, before Nazi Germany arrives. However, on June 22nd, 1941, Nazi Germany breaks its treaty and declares war against the Soviet Union. Novogradic is first bombed on June 24th, just two days after the start of war, and again on the 28th. Now, Novogradic is under full German occupation. I want to just briefly discuss the time period between July 4th, um, when Wehrmacht troops moved into Novogradic until August the following year, because tonight's focus really occurs later. And yet to understand those events, we do need to appreciate the history that led up to them. Over the next year and a half, we see a series of events that take place that are in fact very common in towns or villages under German occupation. We see targeted violence that begins with Market Square Massacre, humiliation and abuse as Jews are conscripted for work detail and forced labor. By September, Jews of Novogradic are required to wear a yellow badge, a Star of David, identifying them as Jews as part of a larger dehumanization process. And then on December 8, 1941, we see a mass murder action that takes place in Skridlevo followed by the establishment of a small rural ghetto in the Parisica neighborhood. Life inside the Novogradic ghetto lasts 15 months. And throughout this time, a selection process is going on, right? A selection process is taking place. I, I want to explain this because very often we think of a selection process as offering Jews life or death. 
But I want to be clear that being chosen as a slave laborer was not, we are going to offer you life, but rather, can we use skills that are valuable to us uh, until we let you die by starvation, exposure, or disease? So the selection process in Nevergradic is, what is your profession? What is your trade? How long have you been at this work? How many children do you have? And for those who are useful to the German war effort, they are transferred along with their families from the ghetto to a courthouse, while those who are invaluable are murdered. After another large killing action takes place on August 7th, the surviving Jews, roughly around 1,200 people, are moved into a courthouse building where shops for the craftsmen have already been established. The others remain in the ghetto. So I wanna show you right now, this is a picture. There we go. This is a historical picture of the courthouse in Nevergradic to, taken sometime in the 1930s. And it stands there to this day. So it's from the side view and we're gonna get a better picture of it um, later on. Those at the courthouse remained there knowing full well the fate of everyone who was not with them that day. And many testimonies mention the murder of children who had gone into hiding in the courthouse. When they are released, they are now asked to build their own prison. Thus, before we begin to discuss the museum, I wanted to give a brief history for two reasons. From here on out, we are focusing on a very tiny portion of the Nevergradic Jewish community. The vast majority of people and those from the surrounding areas did not survive long enough to see a work camp established. By the end of 1942, roughly 80% of the total number of victims of the Holocaust are dead. Instead, they have been murdered elsewhere in death camps and in Western Belarus, shot and buried in mass graves. Also, I wanted to give you a sense of who these people are. Jews who have already experienced the Soviet occupation, a German invasion, a number of large scale murder actions in the town and ghettoization. Those who are left are a tiny minority. Some who had survived from other villages and were brought to Novogratik as skilled workers. Many are alone or with small families and they are already deeply traumatized having watched their friends, neighbors, and family members murdered over the past 15 months. So we're now gonna start our tour of the museum. I wanted to show you right now, if you look at your screen, this is a 3D model of the Novogradic work camp that exists at the Jewish Resistance Museum today. The museum built in 2007 was established at this site. I want you to notice this is the front view of the courthouse. In front of the courthouse, you see two pinkish orange uh, buildings. These are the workshops. There's a fence, double fence, that surrounds the entire work camp and two guard towers. You see there's, you can see them in the photograph. There are guard towers that are standing outside of the fence to make sure there are no escapees. There are the barracks, which to the left of the courthouse, right? And then there's the tunnel. Oh, sorry, can we go back to the last photo? Maybe. Thank you. So you see the barracks to the left of the courthouse and you'll see this black line that is to represent the tunnel that is eventually built. I also wanna draw your attention in outside of the tunnel uh, for the vast majority of the time that I'm talking about, this is a wheat field that is covered and that's gonna play an important role later on. Now in August, 1942, a closed ghetto acting as a work camp is established this time with two rows of wooden fencing surrounded by German police units and local guards known as black crows to inmates because of their uniform. Roughly 600 people are inside this camp, including 300 women and 32 teenagers. In front of the courthouse, the workstations are set up. During the day, furriers sewed coats and mittens for the Wehrmacht, shoes made felt uh, shoemakers made uh, boots with leather soles, tailors made clothes for German officers and their wives, and saddles were being produced for German horses, trimmed in tin. 
We're going to go now to the picture of the, there we go. These were the stables that were converted into barracks during the camp period. This is what the barracks look like today and where the Jewish Resistance Museum is located. Inside is a replica of what the barracks looked like during the camp period. What you're looking at right now is the first room of the museum today. They have replicas of the bunk beds identified with plaques. You can see it in the photo with the names of the people who slept there during the camp period. And rather than me even try to explain it, I wanted to give uh, share testimony of Jewish inmates themselves who lived it. So what we have in front of us right now, this is a photograph of Sula Volos Ahinsky Ruvain. And at the time she's around 17 years old. This is taken from her memoirs written after the war. So she's writing about her experience. We were in the Der Workshop, the workshop in the court, near the courthouse, about 500 people. We were given some kind of cold staple where we were about 40 people on triple bunks, mostly boards and straw. Mama and Papa slept on the first bunk, the lowest. On the second, Rita and I, a fine girl, Shana, with her younger sister and husband on the third. In the middle of this gray drab room was one tin oven not enough to keep us warm, even within three feet of it. On this, we cooked whatever we could and warmed our hands around it. There was no water in the camp and we were led twice a day under police escort with pails to a well outside. Sula eventually left the ghetto after a few attempts before the tunnel escape. Now we're gonna start in 1943. The very beginning of this year, a resistance committee is organized by a Dr. Kagan from Baranowitz, and this included other activists. Some of them had been members of the pre-war parties or the youth movement that I mentioned before. They understand that the time has come by January, 1943, that staying in the camp means certain death. So plans are, dis are discussed to escape, resist, or die trying. The first idea of an escape was to make a copy of the key to the main entrance and then rush the guards. The plan was attempted a few times unsuccessfully. However, the Germans seem to understand at this point that something sus suspicious is going on. And so they tried to smuggle in an informant to reveal any plans of the resistance. His behavior, however, arouses suspicion and members of the resistance group kill him in the camp before he could do any damage. A fourth and last massacre takes place on May 7th, in which nearly half of the people who were in the camp are murdered, around 300 people. And now the resistance understands that the time has come, time is running out. A new plan is developed, this time to dig a 100 meter tunnel under the fence of the ghetto into the adjoining fields. Three people are said to have come up with the original idea. Beryl Yosolevich, Natan Suharsky, which this is a photograph of him right here, and Idol Vasaman. Work on the tunnel started in late May, and despite tremendous technical difficulties, was carried on each day by roughly 12 volunteers. The plan's execution was only made possible because of the presence of a number of well-qualified craftsmen, including Salik Yokobovich who organized the project as well as extra food rations for the volunteers. Now, his participation in the resistance is made only more remarkable by the fact that he was head of the Jewish police. And we see that in Novogradic, those in leadership positions are the resistance. And that's truly incredible when you compare that with other ghettos and other work camps. So the extra dirt that has been collected from the tunnel is stored in the ceiling of the barracks. And what exists today in the museum, in the last room, is draped brown cloth from the ceiling. And it's meant to symbolize the bending boards from the weight of the soil. It's actually a very lovely artistic component in the museum. As the work progressed, electricity was installed by sapping the main line, but not to disrupt the electricity of the main camp. And a makeshift trolley was installed and wagon to carry out the earth which was pulled by a rope made of strips of material. 
Do you remember the guard towers that I pointed out in the 3D model? So electricians prepared to put the light projector, which shone around the fence, out of action by short, circuit, short circuiting the line. And to give the appearance that nothing was amiss on the night of the escape, they began cutting electricity actually a few weeks before. This was an incredibly detailed, organized and executed plan. And soon the tunnel was almost ready. The original breakout was planned for August. And yet, just as they were preparing for their escape, the Germans cut the wheat in a field that lay just outside of the camp, destroying the cover that would be necessary when they arrived on the other side of the fence. And as such, it was decided that the tunnel need to be extended from 100 meters to 200 meters. And this took another month. Now, this is testimony from Chaim Lebowitz. Lebo this is his photograph that you can see right here. And I'm speaking from his testimony. It was decided to continue digging the tunnel to a total length of 220 meters. At this stage, heavy rains began to fall. The soil above the tunnel began to crumble. Cracks appeared in the walls of the tunnel. There was a danger that the whole tunnel would collapse it was decided to line the walls of the tunnel with boards. So what you have right here before you is uh, the tunnel that is exposed in the last room of the Jewish Resistance Museum underneath a bunk. And if you've ever been there, it's very dramatically released so that you can see just how small the entrance was. Now, in hindsight, we understand that had they broken out in August, they most likely would have been caught a large scale reprisal action was actually being uh, taking, uh, was, had begun in July, known as Operation Herman, and was taking place in the area against the partisans. This brought 52,000 additional German troops to the area to hunt down partisans and Jews. Still, before the escape, there was internal opposition to the breakout and the 12 men of the resistance committee decided to put it to a vote in this incredible moment of trust uh, that no one would betray the resistance and, and tell anyone. It's also an incredible moment of democracy. Each person was asked if they wanted to escape. 165 people voted to escape and 65 against. And yet those who voted against still agreed to participate. An inmate, Yitzchak Rosenhaus, compiled a list of everyone in the camp and right before, right before the escape, people drew the names of people who they would follow through the tunnel. So on September 26, 1943, at night, 232 Jews, all of the camp inmates, except for a few who preferred to stay and hide in the attic, escaped through this tunnel. The entire escape took roughly an hour and around the same time, the last people were emerging from the tunnel 200 meters away from the camp, guards realized the breakout. Some were caught, some were killed, but about 170 managed to flee, most of them joining the Bielski brothers or other partisan units in the Nalaboki forest. So as you leave the tunnel exhibit today and you exit the museum, you can see a display of iron rods, and this is in the photo in front of you. It's filled with gravel, and it is marking the path of the tunnel above ground. And you can see how the path bends to the left, indicating where the tunnel had to be extended. It ends at the Wall of Remembrance. This is a photograph of the Wall of Remembrance. It contains the names of all of the tunnel escapees and indicates those who survived, those who did not, and those whose story we do not know. Those who escaped from the tunnel that evening and even before while in the ghetto require the help of local neighbors. One who we're going to hear about in a minute from Jewish Resistance Museum Guide, Anastasia. And yet this is only a partial conclusion. For everyone here tonight, we understand that this is really only the first part of a much larger story. That in fact, the story continues deep within the Nalaboki forest in the Bielski family camp. So please join us again as we uncover the history and the legend of the Bielski brothers. And can I give a warm welcome 
to Jewish Resistance Museum Guide today, Anastasia. Good evening to everyone. So I'll, I'll tell you one story, it's just one we have time for. So it will be about Bobrovsky family. So Maria Bobrovska is, she's a resident of Novogrodok and she received the title of, of Writers Among the Nation in 1997, uh, in recognition of her parents of the heroism, her friend, uh, parents were France and Francisco Bobrovsky, and actually they are not Belarusian, they are Polish who came to Novogrodok in 1930s uh, from Silesia, from Poland, and um, actually the Kagan family was uh, the one who helped them to settle down in Novogrodok, and they gave them a uh, house to live in. Uh, the Bobrovsky family consists uh, consists of uh, a wife, a husband, and five kids. And also they lived uh, not exactly in the Novogorod, but uh, in uh, near Piresica, it's a tough site, just uh, half a kilometer far from Novogorod. Uh, and uh, the family were poor. Uh, what they did for their living, they were engaged in catching stray dogs. They skin them and then they proceed the skins for sale and also they uh, made um, a soap. And uh, this family actually was very known among the uh, ghetto prisoners. They, uh, the prisoners of the Jewish community, they already knew that uh, Bobrovskis, they had very friendly attitude towards Jews and um, all the prisoners, all the Jews, they used uh, the Bobrovsky's house as a meeting point with the partisans. Uh, also, what Bobrov Bobrovsky's uh, family did, they kept uh, very close contacts uh, with uh, Belsky partisans and uh, they helped uh, uh, escape uh, escapees uh, or get the prisoners or uh, just uh, to find uh, the way to the partisans. What happened later is uh, February 1943. Uh, Bobrovsky family, uh, the husband, so the wife, uh, and uh, one Jewish woman with her five years old uh, daughter, they were shot in the Bobrovsky's house. And uh, late uh, after this, uh, the house was uh, burned uh, down. What happened to, to the kids? Uh, uh, five kids, so Polish kids, they survived. And also uh, these kids, they helped to survive. Uh, uh, the youngest uh, Jewish uh, girl, she was so uh, less than two years old. Uh, four of the kids, they uh, were uh, taken to the concentration camp. To the Gross Grossen, uh, it's a border between Poland and Germany near the Warsaw. Uh, one of them actually died in the camp and uh, the rest they survived. What happened to the youngest uh, Jewish girl? As she was like uh, less than two years old, so uh, the Nazi they uh, mistook her for the Polish girl because uh, this little girl she cannot speak and she cannot even uh, tell her name. So. Uh, they just wrote uh, her as a Bobrovsky starter and uh, they wrote her as Galinka Bobrovsky. And this little girl, she was sent to uh, orphanage in Novogrudek. Later on, um, uh, Syria and Haim Belensky, they adopted Galina and they took her to Israel. And actually, uh, already in, is in Israel, uh, How are the Galina two participants? But nobody's there. Nobody. No sound. You can't hear me. We can hear you. It's okay. Go on. Uh, okay. Okay. Fine. Okay. What happened to later with Galina? Uh, actually, she learned uh, there about her real name that she was Hadashka and that she was not. Uh, um, Galina Mabrowska, but still, actually, she. Oh, uses, we are waiting. Uh, and she uses uh, her name as Galina. And um, as to Galina, it was exactly she and Jack Hagen who wrote testimonies, and they both applied to Yad Vashem uh, with a request to confer the title of writers uh, on the Mabrowska family. And um, perhaps it will be. 
uh, the latest, so like, uh, let's say, news from the Nevagruda that I believe uh, this summer uh, there will be official opening of the monument to the, all the uh, writers among the nation in Novogrudek. It will be 11 names. It will be uh, in Utovka, uh, exactly in the same uh, place where Bobrovsky family house uh, stood before the Nazis burned it down. I believe that's all. Shikra? Great, thank you so, so much for sharing that incredible story with us. I'm gonna now hand, uh, tomorrow would like to introduce uh, a very, very special guest that we have with us this evening, Michael Kagan. Uh, yes, but before that, I would like to, to mention, to say and to greet a survivor, a tunnel escapee. There is a person among us today who escaped through the tunnel. His name is Leonid Zusmanovich. Well, uh, it's a great honor for us, for all of us to have you with us today, uh, Mr. Zusmanovich. And uh, well, I hope that you will speak to us a bit later. I, mm -hmm. I would like to give you a word in a minute. And now, uh, well, the word has Michael Kagan, who is the son of Jack Kagan, the person uh, to whom we owe the very existence of the Jewish Resistance Museum in Novogrudok. And uh, during our meetings, we would like other descendants to intervene and uh, present the stories of their parents of their grandparents and to share them with us. Uh, Michael, please tell us a bit about your father's experience in the ghetto, if you can, and why, why he did it. Why was he so dedicated to preserving the memory uh, about Novogrodok Jews, about the history of Novogrodok Jews, and in particular, the memory about the tunnel and the Belsky partisans. Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Tamara. And thank you for the uh, privilege and honor to be able to speak to you. Um, Tamara and I actually um, co-produced a film about the escape called uh, Tunnel of Hope. And uh, maybe some of you have seen it. Um, and it was during that making the film that we discovered the pathway that you've just seen um, running from the barracks to the exit. So um, if you want to see more um, about uh, uh, testimony, um, then that's a film to watch. Um, I challenge everybody after this is over to do a Google search on what is the greatest tunnel escape of the Second World War? And surprisingly, I only did this about a year ago after I had spent uh, um, a lot of time making uh, the film I just talked about and another film on the ghetto. Um, I decided to Google what was the greatest tunnel escape. And probably many of you have seen the film, The Great Escape. Um, I thought that would be it. It tur turns out <clears throat> that Google gives a tunnel that was built by French um, prisoners of war um, in a place called um, Oflag 2, which is near um, Klamino in northwest Poland. It was 140 meters. Not clear from the article that I read how many people got out. That's the greatest tunnel escape in the Second World War, except it's not. And my father spent his life and a, a lot of his life telling me and then telling Tamara and then telling everybody else in the world what was the greatest escape by tunnel and probably the greatest escape of Jews in the, in the war or as we say in the Shoah, for the Jews it's the Shoah. 
And that was the escape from the work camp that we've just been told about from Navarodok or Novogrudok. And that was the great motivation of my father in, in his later years for going back there in 1992 and um, working with Tamara to find uh, um, the traces not only of Jewish life, but the traces of the escape and the Bielskis and all that. And when I was asked to speak, I, I, wanted, I, I wanted to tell a story about my father um, to, that sort of summarizes his passion for, for the tunnel and for telling, telling the story of the greatest escape. When Tamara and I started working on the film, at the beginning, my father was, uh, was very supportive. I mean, why not? His son is making a film of a t story that was untold. Nobody knew this story except the escapees and, and, and some of their children. I've met children of escapees who never heard of the escape until their parents died or their grandparents died. And then they discover, oh, they were in the tunnel. What tunnel? And my father was supportive until he got to a certain point that he started to get negative about it. And he kept trying to persuade me to stop wasting my time with the film and stop wasting my time looking for the tunnel. And while we were filming and, um, and digging and looking for the tunnel, he came out um, and spent two or three days with us. And all the time he kept saying, stop this, stop this, stop this. And I told him, Dr. Dad, as much as I respect you as my father, um, I'm not, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm, I'm not going to stop the work that I've set out to do, which is to tell the story of the, the, the tunnel that I grew up with. Um, he left, went back to England, but implored me to stop the work. And at a certain point, he phoned me up and said, I want you to stop. And I said, Dad, why? I don't understand why. He said, ever since I got back, I've been walking and walking and walking. And every time I walk, I count the number of footsteps. I take big steps, each one a meter. And I count because I've told the world it was 200 meters long and I'm counting and it's not possible. It couldn't have been 200 meters long. I told everybody and you're going to prove me to be a liar and, 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 and diminish the greatness of the escape. And I said, but dad, even if it's 50 meters long, what does it matter? You escaped. They dug the tunnel. They put the earth all over the place. And believe me, I grew up with stories of where they put the earth. Everywhere you can imagine, they had to uh, uh, hide the earth. I said, it doesn't matter how long it was. He says, it does. If you, if you find it was only 50 meters, then the model in the museum will be wrong. The model in Lochamea Geta Ot will be wrong. In my book will be wrong. I've told everyone it's 200. I said, Dad, we're going to look for the exit. Whatever you say. And two days later, it was Friday after uh, Friday morning, we were due to leave. Um, no, was it Friday? I don't remember. Maybe Sunday. I can't remember. We were due to leave to go back home. And we'd been digging and digging for a whole week. And we hadn't found the tunnel. At the last minute, really on the last day of the last minute, we found um, the, um, a piece of the tunnel very close to where the exit was. It was raining. We were crying. I mean, it was still there. There was a hole in the ground. You could see it. I phoned up. My, I quickly took out my computer and I went on Google Earth and I measured the distance from the barracks that you saw that Shifra just showed us all the way down what is now the path. And I measured it to the point where we were standing and then took it a few meters further. And I phoned up my father and I said, Dad, we found the exit to the tunnel. He said, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I said, Dad, listen, I measured it. You'll never guess how long it is. 208 meters long. You were right. 
It wasn't a dream. It wasn't an illusion. It wasn't a um, you know misrepresentation. It wasn't a lie. It really, really happened. A 208 meter tunnel dug by starving, impoverished Jews, not prisoners of war, from a death camp, not from a prisoner of war camp, out through that wheat field and on and on and on using wood and trolleys and electricity and over 210 Jews got out in one single night. In the, in the Great Escape it was 86 got out and all of them were caught except I think one and 220 Jews got out, 70 got killed getting to the forests or in the forests, but most of them got out into and joined the partisans. And that's what drove my father to have this story told. And you, you hundred, hundred people on this call now are um, witnesses and carriers of the story of the greatest escape of Jews in the Shoah. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michael. This is a story. Oh, I remember you telling all the time that Jack was against the, the film. I didn't really, uh, I could never think that he was afraid his measure, measurement of the tunnel was wrong. Well, this is, this is, this is Jack. Now that was really, that was, he had many <laughs> other reasons. Yeah, he I didn't know, think the film was going to be any but, good. He didn't, it, but that was yes. it. He could not believe what they had actually done, and because, and that's why, when you do a Google search, it also cannot believe what he did, what he was part of. Well, <laughs> uh, Jack was really the person who was so dedicated to preserving this story, and if not him. I, I'm pretty sure there would have been no museum and the story would have been buried in the ground forever. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Zusmanovich, can we hear you please? Would Hi. you please switch on Hi. your mic? Shalom. 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 <laughs> How My are father you? This is Leonid Zusmanovic. At the time, it was called Laser. In 1943, September, he was uh, about uh, nine years old, maybe the youngest uh, child uh, in the camp. Uh, father doesn't really speak uh, English. He can speak Russian, of course, uh, but I'm not sure that... Uh, so okay. this, is, this is my father. He's, he's now 88 years old, is very, very, very excited. At the time that uh, Shira uh, told the story of the, of, of the digging of the tunnel, every time, every word she said, he was uh, just uh, one step before her, telling about how they took the dirt and put it and hide it in the, in the roof. And he told us, uh, me and my sister here, about uh, the camp. Um, he has in, and his father were the only survivors from a family of uh, his uh, mother, his sister, and two brothers that were murdered. And they uh, fled the tunnel and they went to the forest. They actually they didn't join the Bielski, but they joined uh, the Russian uh, uh, partisan period. Period. <laughs> so they, they joined the, the partisans and they spent there uh, maybe uh, more than a, a year in the partisans. And they survived the war. And uh, in 1960, my father uh, came to Israel and raised a uh, family here. And he's very, very excited. And we are all, I'm, I'm uh, like, uh, you know, like many others, I assume. It, for me, it was a story of the life. All the time you hear the story of Novogotek and the tunnel and the escape and the partisans. For me as a child, it was very thrilling to hear all those uh, stories. And uh, 
That's it, I mean, shortly, I, I assume. Well, thank you very much thank for you, this thank you description. For, uh, I would like to say on behalf of all of us, uh, thank you very much for this exciting uh, tour. And Tamara, all the great uh, things that you're doing for the remembering uh, Novogodek and the community and the Kagan family. Actually, father met uh, Jack a few years back. They met in Tel Aviv uh, and they had a very nice evening. So again, thank you all and uh, bye. Bye. <laughs> well, I would like to talk to you later in Russian, probably in Russian, and ask you about many, many details about the story, if you please. No problem. So no send, send me a contact, how I can contact you in, in chat. Please write in chat how I can contact you. Okay. Ma. Я очень, очень, очень расстроен этим видением, то, что я сегодня вижу, и проходит у меня все перед глазами, все это моя жизнь. Все это я прошел, и я очень рад слышать от людей и от вас, что вы чудная женщина, что вы относитесь, относитесь к этому э, музею с большой, с большой любовью. И я очень вам благодарен за это. Я... Okay, I will send you uh, on the chat uh, our yes. contact. We don't want to uh, take more time of everybody. Yeah. And we will, of course, uh, stay and watch the, uh, the rest of the evening. Thank you all. Can I just interrupt very quickly and just ask where are you located in the in the world? Um, we've got a question. Uh, we are we are in Israel in uh, Kiryat Bialik. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Zusmanovic said that he feels very emotional about the story, and when Shifra was presenting the story of the tunnel and the escape, he. Uh, commented with his own details all the time because the whole picture is in front of his eyes right now and uh, he's grateful that we have we keep uh, this story alive he's grateful to me and he's grateful to people who work at the museum uh, now thank you very much uh, this is a real surprise and a real gift for us to see you and to talk to you uh, I know that um, uh, most of the tunnel escapees joined the Belsky partisans, and uh, the Belsky detachment, and became uh, partisans of the Belsky brigade. And there is one uh, Belsky. There are many Belskys among us today, but there is one of Belsky who is a real Belsky, Aaron. Uh, Henrika, can you please switch on the microphone for us to greet Aaron? Henrika? Well, I see Henrika here, but, but uh, probably she doesn't hear me now. Well, uh, the Belsky, uh, the tunnel escape took place and was successful only because those who were digging the tunnel, they knew that there is a place for them where they can find shelter and protection. They knew about the Belsky partisans. They had contact to the Belsky partisans, but unfortunately, during the escape, this contact was broken because of the Herman operation, punitive operation. Yet in small groups, many of them managed to reach the Belskis, more than 100 people. Uh, the story of the Belsky partisans is also presented at the Jewish Resistance Museum in Novokrudo, because all, uh, these two stories are connected and uh, they, these two stories, they make a very special page in the history of the Holocaust uh, in general, and a very special page in the history of Jewish resistance. Well, uh, there is a place in the forest where the Belskis had their camp 
for eight or nine months during the last period of the war. This place is in the Naliboki forest. Uh, local people and Russian partisans used to call this camp, their camp, Forest Jerusalem. And until uh, recently, recently I mean until uh, the defiance was launched, nobody knew about that place. Nobody knew about that place until Peter Duffy, who wrote the book, The Belsky Brothers, came to Belarus to research this story. And he uh, wanted to see every place where the Belskis fought, every place where they had their dugouts. He wanted to talk to people, non-Jews, who knew the Belsky partisans during the war. So that's how, thanks to Peter Duffy, we found that place in the forest, thanks to one woman, uh, a Polish woman who lived in the village called Klitsische. Her name was uh, Leokadia, Leokadia Lankovic. She was friendly with Sula. She spoke about Sula, Sula Wolozitski, Sula Rubin. So Leokadia befriended Sula because Sula got sick in the forest and was put into Leokadia's house for a whole month until she recovered. And later on, when she went back to the forest, Leocadia visited her friend every day, and she knew every pass and every turn in the camp. So we knew exactly, and we know now exactly, where the Belsky camp was. Uh, we did some research, preliminary research in the Belsky camp, and now our aim is to continue and to finally commemorate the Belsky partisans there in the forest. In a very special way, because it's a forest and it's a forest reserve, natural reserve. That's why we invite all of you who are present today and please spread the word to other people who are not with us today, that we are building now a sort of uh, community who want the same, who share our wish, who can contribute in any way with any information about the camp. We need details. We need details about life in the camp, about how it was constructed, about how it was planned. And hopefully we'll manage, we'll manage to do it because miracles happen. You know, as it happened with the Jewish Resistance Museum, out of nothing, out of nowhere, after 70 years being buried in the ground, it's now above the ground and is developing. So we want to do one more step and one more thing for the Belsky partisans. If you have any questions, please, you can switch on your microphone and ask or write in the chat. And our next meeting will be about the Belsky partisans, the story of the Belsky partisans. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tamara, and thank you, Shifra. Um, I'll give people time to um, formulate their questions. I'm sure there are many. Um, I just wanted to, um, there are a few comments that have been sent to me, just to pass on to you. So Tamara, from Susan Bach, Bach I'm not quite sure how it's said. Bach. Uh, it's, she said, Tamara, how impressive your sharing of the remarkable story, your dedication to the museum, the inmates and the escapees is beyond admirable. We met at the museum in the summer of 2016 and look forward to coming back at some point, hopefully in the near future with our children and grandchildren. The fact that you are not Jewish makes you, in my mind, a righteous Gentile. My parents were in the ghetto and eventually joined the Bielskis. My uncle was one of the escapees. Thank you. Thank you all for what you're doing from Susan Abrams. Abramovich. Thank you, Susan. I'd like to say uh, something. Uh, I'm uh, a couple of... I would like to say something. I'm yes, Belarus from Israel. 
Yeah, yes, Bella, Bella Bella is, to tell Bella everybody. Is also a Belsky. Let yes, me hear. Let me was a Belsky, yeah. and she and my father and several other family members were the first nine people, I think, to go into the forest before Tuvia. Uh, what I wanted to say was, not retell the story, you can see the film and ask questions, but I have now been invited to go to Germany in April to commemorate the um, day that the Nazis uh, surrendered and uh, to show the film Defiance in a museum called the Bada House where I was born. This was the place where there was an American controlled displaced persons camp where I was born. I was one of the first people born there, first children, first children born after the war there. And they invited me to, to speak to the German community there who knew very little bit about the Jews who lived in that camp. And they're very interested in their projects that I'm involved in there. Historians, uh, Sybil Kraft is one, is the main historian. And uh, it, it's really a, a, a wonderful experience to have German people interested in what happened to the Jews. And they're going to see this film and it, it'll be a special event for them. So I just wanted to tell people about that. And then I'm off to the Tampa Holocaust Museum since my research now is in, um, in this field. And uh, I welcome all of you to jump, come and visit these places. The Bada House Museum is a fantastic museum. So, and I wanna thank all of you, Tamara and everybody else who told me about this wonderful um, evening. I'm sitting in a lot right now <laughs> on vacation <Great>. for change. <laughs> and a love to my sisters who are out there somewhere. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. I'll be visiting Uncle Aaron in Florida in April as well. A couple of questions that um, one is addressed to Shifra. Uh, Shifra, that's for you from Julie Borshavsky. Is Shifra connected to Pupko family who lived in Pittsburgh and in Canada? Shifra, you're very welcome to respond. Where is Shifra? Shifra. Uh, she's probably away because she she said that she she may be away for a minute. Okay, we'll come back to Shifra. Yes, we'll come back to Shifra later. Shifra. Shifra is related to them. I asked her the same question before. Okay, thank you. So indeed, Shifra is related. And another question is from uh, Brian uh, Eichelney, or sorry, I'm saying it wrong. Eichelney. Pikelny, Brian Pikelny, um, uh, Raya Kushner, the grandmother of Jared Kushner, Donald Trump's son-in-law, was a Belsky partisan. Was she one of the uh, work camp tunnelers or did she join the Belskis earlier? Tamara, I think what you can... Did I hear them say they had a museum in Afula? Uh, well, Raya Kushner, the grandmother of Jared Kushner. Yes, please, repeat the question, please. Raya Kushner, the grandmother of Jared Kushner, uh, uh, was uh, a Belsky partisan. Was she one of the war camp tunnelers who dig the tunnel, or did she join the Belskis earlier before that? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Raya Kushner was in the labor camp together with her uh, family at the beginning. Her mother and uh, her mother was killed on May seven during uh, the last massacre, May 7, 1943, when 250 or, or about 300 people, mostly women and children were killed. Araya and her sister Leia, they were uh, all the time in the labor camp when the tunnel was being uh, dug. Well, they participated even in uh, the tunnel construction by hiding the dirt from the tunnel. They were not digging because tunnel diggers were uh, men, young boys, young men. Uh, but uh, Raya and Leia, uh, like many others, they transferred the dirt from the tunnel and later uh, would uh, put it into their pockets and take out and disperse somewhere on the territory of the camp, in the well or somewhere else. They participated in the escape. Uh, they uh, came 
together with their father and another tunnel escapee, they came to a Polish farmer uh, who showed them the way to Russian partisans. They spent a whole month with Russian partisans and only a month later, they joined the Belskis and uh, stayed until liberation with the Belskis. Let me add something also um, from Khoni Kushner was her brother who um, um, was one of the main diggers in the tunnel and he was killed um, during the exit uh, from the tunnel on the day of the escape, he was killed. Um, in fact, what we saw from Schiffer's presentation of the bunks, if you remember that, the, the, the shown of the bunks, the reconstruction of the bunks, I think that the bunk that we were being shown, if you look carefully, says on it, uh, the Kushners. I think that was the one. So it was, it was, that was where the family Kushners were um, sleeping. Thank you. Tamara, another question from Ken Domeshek. Uh, are the SKP, uh, SKP names available? Yes. Uh, for the escape, a list of all those who were to escape through the tunnel was compiled. The list, the copy of this list survived. Uh, the original copy is now in, in Israel, in the museum called Beit Lachami Hagitaot. Uh, there is a research done, finished already, on all the panel escapees by uh, Betty Cohen. She's the daughter of Fania Dunitz, who also escaped through the tunnel. And Betty uh, researched practically the story of every tunnel escapee. Probably about 10 or 15 people only remain uh, unknown. I mean, the stories are unknown, but most stories are already in the book, which will be published soon by uh, Valentine's Mitchell Publishing House. So there will be another book about the tunnel escapees. Thank you, Tamara. Another one from Alan Finkenstein. Uh, where can we find the film Tunnel of Hope? Uh, tunnel of Hope is uh, on the internet, I believe, Michael. Um, it's actually, you'd have to go to the website, go to uh, films. Um, it's an Israeli distributor, and I think you have to pay a small amount of money to be able to have access to that film. Go to films. Okay, thank you. Uh, and we have another comment and information, I think, from Melissa Sussman. Um, granddaughter uh, of two Belsky partisans and my grandmother's best friend, Kiana, Kugelmas is still alive and surviving member of this escape. I have a memoir that I never had translated from my grandfather. And that's information from Melissa. And uh, Melissa, if you hear us, maybe you can get in touch with us after the, the event and uh, we can talk about this. Uh, I have... some messages in my chat too. Well, from Yael Zirbelkrank. Yael, I remember the visit of your family very well. And uh, I hope that your brother will join the Israeli archeologists who are planning to come this year to Belarus. God's willing, the situation will come down and the war will stop and uh, traveling will be possible because Shifra and I um, have a plan to bring several archaeologists from Israel who will research the Belsky camp with uh, geo radars non-invasive research without digging. We want to have a complete plan of the camp in order to uh, allocate the territory for the future memorial there in the forest. And I have another, I don't know from whom because I don't see the name, but uh, someone asks what is the best place to donate money to the museum and to, to, to the Belsky partisans project. So please contact me by email or uh, 
the together plan. We sent you the link for, for the meeting today. There's one more question. And are you okay with all the craziness with Russia? We are not okay. Nobody is okay. And really the very fact that we are having this meeting and talking about the story from nearly from 80 years ago uh, makes me feel at times uh, not very comfortable because and not very much at ease because the war is at our doorstep. Um, Tamara, there's a, a, another message um, from, um, if you have a look in your uh, chats, um, it's come, some people were coming and going in, 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 uh, in and out late, so it was a sorry if I missed this, but how did the escapees get to, uh, get to the Bielski Forest from the, from the tunnel? Um, that was from Mike Levy. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this was uh, really uh, be beyond the plan of the escape how to reach the forest and how to find the Belskis in the forest. Uh, escape itself was perfectly organized. Everything was done. The escape itself lasted one hour, no more. But what to do when they got out of the tunnel was a big problem. And where to go was up to the escapees. Of course, they couldn't go as one big group. That's why they uh, arranged with each other to divide into small groups and had each group had a plan of their own. Everybody knew where to look for the Belsky partisans. I mean the direction. Everybody knew about Kostik Kozlovsky, who was a contact with the Belskis uh, since the very beginning of the detachment. He lived uh, in, on a farm near the village of Makretz, and he provided help to more than 500 Jews. Kosti Kozlovsky became the writers uh, uh, among the nations. He got this title as the first person from the area of Novogrudok in 1994. If not him, uh, it would have been different, I mean, the, for the Belsky brothers and for the Belsky partisans in general. He was so dedicated to helping every Jew who found his farm could um, hope to get food, shelter, and then uh, Kostik himself or his brothers took uh, the Jews to the forest. Those who escaped through the tunnel, some of them also uh, came to the Kozlovsky farm. But uh, many other partisans, many other escapees, they traveled to fight the Belskis for weeks, some of them even for months, you know, because nobody showed them the way and nobody accompanied them on their way. They couldn't use bigger roads. They had to travel through the forest. Uh, they had to get some food and rely on strangers, on local uh, non-Jews who lived on isolated farms in the forest. And uh, those people who, on whose doors or windows the escapees knocked of course they knew about the escape. Of course they could recognize that Jews were asking for help and they knew about the danger. But as Jack Kagan, for example, told that he and his colleague got food in two places, in two houses. Once it was a piece of bread. The second time it was a piece of bread and milk. And it was the tastiest bread he had ever had in his life. I'd like to uh, add something to that. Um, so my father in the winter of 1942 had tried to escape and um, fell into, um, fell through ice over a, a, a river in the forest and had to crawl back to the camp, into the camp and had, had his um, toes amputated because um, because of gangrene was setting in. 
So he was really an invalid in the camp, which and kept hidden because if uh, the Germans would have found somebody who wasn't working there, they would have killed him. So he remained hidden, um, and he slowly recovered and managed to walk uh, until the point he walked. And then there was the tunnel, and he realized that if he escaped and tried to run in the shortest distance from the camp to the forest to try and get to the Bielskis. He would never make it by dawn and anyone out in the open when the sun came up would have got uh, um, caught and killed. And he knew he couldn't run that fast. So he came up with another plan, which is um, very typical of my father, which is to go in the opposite direction. And coming out of the tunnel, instead of turning right towards the forest, he went with a friend of his, um, Oppenheimer, and turned left and went around the town from the other side, moving away from the forests, knowing that when, um, when it was dawn, the Germans and their helpers would be chasing people on the way to the forest in the direct line, and he would be safe going all the way around town. So they stayed hidden during the day, and then over the next two or three days, managed to go all the way around the town and then finally get to the forest, entered the forest, and um, had no idea where to go or what to do. And while they were on a path in the forest, they heard the sounds of a horse and cart, and they hid, fearing that it might be Polish partisans. And they heard uh, the, um, horse, uh, the horse driver um, singing Yiddish songs. And they came out and there was a big uh, uh, welcoming committee and, and, they, and, and then they were taken deep into the forest to meet the, uh, the Bielskis. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I'll get another comment. I don't know from whom, but I'm, it's a very nice comment. I can, um, I'm going to read it. We were fortunate enough to meet Tamara when we were in Novogrudok in 2018. She took us to see the extraordinary Jewish resistance site, which we would not have known about otherwise. The next day, she made time in her very busy schedule to take us on a remarkable tour through obscure small farms and villages near Novogrudok, where our grandparents and great-grandparents had lived. They immigrated to Baltimore in the early 1900s. Her knowledge, insight, and energy were the most memorable aspect of our time in Belarus. These ambitious plans for a permanent memorial could have no more effective leader than Tamara, and we hope it will gather tremendous support. We will always be grateful. So thank you, Tamara. We have another question from Jane Alper. Perhaps it was already said. Uh, how did uh, diggers know the tunnel direction? And that's, uh, and that's from Elena Malamut. Tamara? Oh, that was a, a big problem, you know, for them to know in what direction they were digging. Because all the work was done uh, in the darkness, under the ground. And the tunnel was very narrow. It was only 70 centimeters high and 70 centimeters wide one meter under the surface. To check the direction, uh, they had to check it from the, uh, not from the inside, they couldn't do it from the inside, but from the outside. Well, uh, they used holes which they made in the ground above the tunnel. The holes were made to bring the air inside the tunnel. And they used these small holes for checking the direction of the tunnel by putting sticks from the inside out, penetrating one meter layer of the ground of the earth above the tunnel. And they uh, checked from the attic where the sticks were showing the direction. And if the direction was wrong, they uh, corrected it. Uh, in one, uh, at one place, they had to uh, turn, to make a turn, because uh, they came across some big, huge stone under, this, under the ground. And uh, later on, it proved uh, good for them because uh, their exit from the tunnel happened to be under the slope of the hill. 
they, that's how they hid the exit from the tunnel. Thank you, Tamara. Uh, we've got another question or question comment from uh, uh, Ricky Lipsky Kaufman. Can you ask Ralph Wolf uh, if he is my relative family? I haven't seen him for about 40 years. Sorry to write, I have no connection to him today. Um, Tamara, can you throw some light onto this question about Ralph Wolf? Uh, unfortunately, not now, but, but uh, well, please uh, send basic information uh, and then we'll try to do some research. Great. All right. Uh, we have a question from Larissa. Are there many survivors, uh, survivors' testimonies of the tunnel? I have read Jake Kagan's accounts, but uh, are there more? Well, there are, of course, there are testimonies, maybe um, several dozens of testimonies of the tunnel escapees. Some of them are in Warsaw at the Jewish Historical Institute, others in Yad Vashem. Most of the testimonies are in Hebrew, Yiddish. Only a few of them are in Polish. And I personally haven't read every testimony yet. All right, thank you so much. Uh, a question from Nadina and Brian. Is there a museum about the Belsky brothers in Israel, in Afula possibly? No. You know, it's a paradox. The Belsky's uh, partisan story uh, wasn't paid proper attention anywhere in the world, uh, either in Yad Vashem or uh, in other big uh, museums uh, dedicated to the Holocaust in America, for example. Uh, and this is, uh, this has its own explanation because the Belsky partisans were a very special partisan detachment. They were a family partisan group. They had a group of fighters, 150 people, but the rest were non-fighters who also had some uh, guns and, and rifles and, and fought and participated in different missions, like cutting telephone and telegraph poles or uh, collecting food. They needed guns to, uh, to get some food uh, from villages. Uh, but uh, they were not that kind of resistance, you know, which was immediately praised uh, right after the war. And uh, our mission, our aim to commemorate the Basque partisans is also due to this fact, you know, because this story must be remembered. Why? because they valued life more than anything else at the time when life cost nothing. It was war, like now, to, like today. People are killed and this becomes normal, which is abnormal in its way. And Tuvia said that he would rather save old Jewish woman than kill 10 Germans. Thank you, Tamara. But another comment and question, and I think Deborah's got another couple of comments. Um, I am going to read the last one I've got uh, from Gloria Blumenthal. Thank you so much for this presentation and all your work. My husband and I visited the Novogrudek Museum in 2003, and you, Tamara, took us to the site of the camp. My father, Nahum Shlimovich, escaped and joined a group of Russian partisans. How can we find more information about their activities? Um, the Together Plan <laughs> has a group of researchers who research in the archives and there is a national archives in Minsk which contains all the documents about partisans, about the partisan movement. So uh, it can be personal files, it can be accounts about combat operations. If, if uh, Shlimovich participated as, as a fighter, for example, or it can be even mentioning uh, about him uh, if he had some uh, work to do in the camp. Like, for example, there is a document in the National Archives about uh, two Kushner brothers who were praised by the commander, by Tuvia Belsky, 
for organizing the work uh, in the workshop. And their job was to make hats in the forest. So please contact us with details and yeah, we'll do some research. Tamara, um, I've just put, I'm just putting into the chat that if anybody is interested in um, archives, then they can contact us at archive at thetogetherplan.com. Um, there were a couple of comments, yes. Um, one from Heather Markson, uh, who says, one of the docents at the Jewish Heritage Museum at, of Monmouth County in New Jersey is a niece of the Bielski brothers. Um, that was her comment. And then another from Brian Kelney saying, Yes, I talked with Jack Hagen on the phone when my father and I visited Novogradok in 2000. Jack was an absolute mensch and may his memory be forever blessed. Um, and I thought that was quite a nice way to kind of bring this um, to a, con uh, a conclusion uh, because as Shifra said uh, at the beginning, uh, we are, um, this is part one of three. Um, and uh, I thought I'm, I'd just put this uh, up. Oops, let me just go to the right side. Um, to, uh, I'd, I'd like to say um, thank you uh, to, um, to Tamara um, for your expertise, um, uh, for all of the work that you do, which is extraordinary, to Shifra Putko uh, for putting this wonderful presentation together and of course for your wonderful expertise. Um, thank you to Anastasia at the Jewish Resistance Museum. Thank you to Michael Kagan. It's always a pleasure to be doing anything with you. Uh, thank you to our tour um, in Belarus in, in our office in Minsk and to uh, uh, somebody you haven't seen who's in the background, uh, Jack Baum, who, who, with whom we couldn't manage without. Um, we are delighted that uh, we've been able to put this event together. We're very excited to be able to bring you the next one and more will follow shortly about that. Um, and in the meantime, just to wish you all uh, safety um, at this very difficult time. Um, and uh, we're delighted that you've been able to join us. And thank you. Well done, Deborah. Well done. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.